Hey, welcome to the podcast. Sit back, relax. Try not to throw nothing at me because you won't hurt my feelings. You'll just hurt your computer. This podcast is brought to you by your host, me, Robert McCune. Right. Hello again. Sorry, I haven't been uh, putting out the podcast for a couple of weeks. I had a little problem with my uh, throat, but everything's back to normal and I'm back. Got a little bit to talk about today. Uh, we're going to be dealing with uh, China. Looks like they're preparing for war, and I'll jump into that in a minute. Uh, U.S. issued a nuclear warning to Russia. I'll get into that in a minute. We've got the elections to talk about. Um, you probably, it's all over every news outlet, so you probably know all about it. We got some gun laws that uh, got beat up in court pretty bad, so we'll talk about that too. Just sit back, relax, and uh, I'm here to entertain you. Oh, yeah, and before I forget, we got Facebook to talk about. Uh, apparently, Mark Zuckerberg is laying off more than 11,000 employees. I'll talk about that in a minute, too. And Elon took over Twitter. He just got rid of all the subjective team for uh, Twitter. Apparently, he is taking over in mass, pissing on every tree, marking his territory, and he's going to make sure everyone knows he's the big dog. So, starting with Facebook here. Since Zuckerberg founded Facebook in 2004, the Silicon Company has steadily hired more employees, and at the end of September, it's amassed the largest number of workers ever, totaling 87,314 people. However, on Wednesday, the company began cutting jobs and uh, deeply slashing uh, paychecks, or wages, I should say. So the company said it was laying off more than 11,000 workers, or about 13% of its workforce, in what really amounted to the company's most significant job cuts. The layoffs were made across departments and regions, uh, though some areas like recruiting and business teams were affected the most here. So what do you think? Zuckerberg and uh, Elon, they're you know, maybe in a little competition here to see who can do what more than the other. So Zuckerberg released a statement. He said he wanted to take accountability for these decisions and for how we got here. He said, I know it's tough for everyone, and I'm especially sorry to those who are impacted. The cuts nearly triple what Twitter announced last week. Uh, it represents a stunning reveal of uh, reversal of fortune and once high-flying company whose ambitions uh, and room for growing has seemed limitless. I guess it's not limitless. So the 11,000 plus jobs that uh, Facebook is cutting is a huge number compared to Twitter. And everybody freaked out when Elon Musk announced that he was counting, uh, cutting about 3,700 jobs. Uh, that's basically half of the company's workforce in a bid to cut costs. Um, Bloomberg News reported on Wednesday, citing that uh, people familiar with the matter, Twitter's new owner will inform the staff affected on Friday, according to the report. Well, he did. Uh, apparently, Musk or the, who's ever ahead of his HR fired people by email. Can you imagine getting an email saying that you've been terminated? They don't even have the balls to do it face to face. But Elon didn't stop there. The Tesla CEO, uh, Elon Musk, said in an email to all employees at the electric vehicle maker on Friday that the company will also cut 10% of salary workers and will instead rely more on hourly workers. So there goes Tesla as well. Everything's on the chopping block. I wonder if Elon's starting to feel the money pinch. From acquiring like a, I don't know, what did he pay? Like $2 billion through Twitter? So anytime somebody shells out that kind of money, every employee of the, uh, whatever company they own should pucker up that asshole because they know bad things are coming. And I have a correction to make. It was pointed out to me just now by uh, someone here in the studio. It wasn't $2 billion. I misspoke. 
It was $44 billion. That's right, $44 billion he paid for Twitter. A ridiculous amount of money. I mean, severely ridiculous. Nothing in this world should cost $44 billion. I mean, what is he buying? Like the United States for that kind of money? The deal valued at $44 billion represents the biggest social media buyout since Facebook uh, was acquired uh the WhatsApp in 2014. I mean, come on, folks. We're way out of touch with expenditures here. I mean, you got sports. Take sports, for example. They pay like $20 million to a quarterback just to play a game. Yes, they draw big revenues, um, and obviously they can afford it. But Jesus, the amount of money that's spent, that's why we all pay, you know, well, I, I don't know. I, I haven't been to a sports game, uh, a stadium in, oh, my God, over 20 years. So I have no idea what they pay for. you pay for tickets. But I bet you it's up there. Uh, that's not a cheap venture. Even concerts nowadays, you pay $150 for a ticket in some concert venues. What the hell is that? Who deserves to get paid that much money just to play a so couple of songs? Here's a newsflash. You can buy the, or download the media for pennies on the dollar and listen to whole albums. Well, I guess they don't have albums anymore. I don't know what the hell they call it, but um, the whole thing. I mean, do you really need to pay that much money just to lay eyes on the person? And here's another newsflash. Anything that's put out in media form, like when we had CDs and your downloads from Apple or whatever, the quality of that is like a thousand times better. So what the hell are we doing spending all that kind of money? I mean, in today's economy, when it costs, you know, $100 to fill your gas tank, uh, around $800 to $1,000 a month to feed your family, who the hell is making this kind of money just to throw away on, on just watching somebody? Not, not to mention, you know, yeah, you say, well, it's entertainment. I'm watching a show. You're watching some asshole run around on the stage singing. When Do you really need to watch them? Do you really need to visually see that? Are you really going to pay $150 just to watch somebody walk around a stage singing a song you like? That's ridiculous to me. All right, so enough about that rant. Let's talk a little bit about China. Apparently, China is wrapping up its nuclear, uh, ramping up its nuclear stockpile, including uh, hypersonic missiles. Now, uh, the, a bulletin from the atomic scientist uh, study says China has 350 nuclear warheads, but significantly more than previously thought. Now, China has been putting out uh, statements saying that it's concerned about its security, and they've been posturing and um, fortifying their defenses. And some experts are saying that China is actually just ramping up to prepare to invade Taiwan. Well, China has been ramping up its naval drills as well. Uh, if you listen to my podcast, one of my podcasts before, I announced how uh, there was like, I don't know, four China warships and four or six Russian naval vessels uh, doing maneuvers off of the uh, coast of Alaska. All right, let's jump right into Russia news now. Uh, Newsweek is reporting Russia warns of radiation disaster as it ramps up nuclear war talks. So Anatoly Anatov, Russia's ambassador to the United States, warned of a radiation disaster on Wednesday as the Kremlin continues to ramp up nuclear war talks. Now, um, in an article posted by the Russian ambassador, uh, excuse me, embassy, on uh, the Telegram messaging app stated, today we face a th the threat of radiation disaster. Basically, he doubled down on Russia's claim that Ukraine intends to use dirty bombs. 
although both Ukraine and U.S. officials have staunchly rejected claims Kiev was plotting to explode any device of nuclear magnitude. So what I believe, and this is just my unprofessional opinion here, um, Russia is going to keep talking about this and then do something and blame it on Ukraine. They're going to have some kind of, they're going to explode some kind of dirty bomb over in Ukraine and say, this was what Ukraine's been working on and it blew up in their face or something. Mark my words, watch, this is, this is going to happen. So basically the detonation of such a radiological explosive device, like a dirty bomb, will have a magnitude comparable to a low yield nuclear weapon. Uh, the blast will dissipate radioactive substances over the area, uh, up to several thousand meters usually, contaminating territories um, for about 30 to 50 years, actually. So it has a pretty, pretty potent effect. So in response to this, the International Atomic Energy, the IAEA, <laughs> issued a statement on Thursday saying that it's been granted unfeathered access to the Institute of Nuclear Research in Kiev. Uh, Eastern Mining and uh, the Processing Plant in, I can't pronounce it, Zyat, Cody, wherever the hell that is in Ukraine, and Production Association in another area, um, based on the evaluation of the results available uh, to date, the information provided by Ukraine, the agency did not find any indications of undeclared nuclear activities and or materials at any locations. Keep in mind, a dirty bomb is relatively easy uh, to construct. Once you get your hands on, say, nuclear pellets or whatever, it's just a matter of combining it with an explosive, like, say, dynamite. When it explodes, it uh, spreads the radioactive particles over hundreds of meters. So, yeah, it, it's pretty easy to do undetected. So that's the devil's advocate there. It is possible for basically anyone that ha can get their hands on um, any radiological material. I mean, it has to be potent enough. It almost has to be um, war grade to, to be really effective. But even even if it's not, if it's just a high grade uh, nuclear capability material, that's going to do a lot of damage to a lot of people. So Russia's uh, people is starting to do what the United States did during the Cold War. Russians are starting to build bomb shelters in their own homes as concerns about the potential of nuclear we uh, use of nuclear weapons. See, that's not a bad idea in any event in case of like natural disaster or whatever to have some sort of uh, pre-planned shelter. But basically, when you're looking to build an underground um, semi-buried bunker, it usually is usually designed for like one or two people uh, because space is limited. And unless you, you know, you got millions of dollars to go with a whole blown structure and they usually take about three months to, to build out. So people tend to react at the last minute of things when just about when the disaster is about to hit. Nobody prepares, like, say, for hurricanes or, or blizzards. They wait until it's actually announced, and then they, what do they do? They rush to the stores and clear the shelves out. They just frantically grab whatever they, they, they can get their hands on. Look what happened to COVID. You couldn't find a piece of toilet paper in the entire United States. People went nuts. They started hoarding toilet paper. It's like, what do they think? They're going to be able to eat it, too? Well, I suppose you could, but I don't think there's much nutrition there. When the government or local media agencies announce that they're about to be hit by a blizzard or hurricane, the first thing everybody does is run right out to the store, buy milk, bread, and batteries. Um, yeah, okay, that's really preparing for, you know, the disaster that you might have to flee your house to survive. And Think about it. If you get any prolonged natural disaster, what the hell is a gallon of milk and a loaf of bread going to do for you? And unless you've got some way to recharge the batteries, they're only going to last so long, too. I mean, 
okay, so you can keep the milk cold. Well, if it's that bad of a natural disaster, you lose power. That milk's going to go bad very quickly. That bread is going to go stale and moldy within a week. So the bread you got a little better chance with, but I never understood milk. Why does everybody hoard milk for a disaster? I mean, unless you have small children that, you know, you need milk for formula or something, I could see that. But adults and adult children, um, or even, you know, semi-adult children, you can survive without milk for a week. And I thought Russia was supposed to be so poor. There was a statement released by a company that builds uh, bomb shelters, and they're saying they have shelter uh, cost range from $16 million to $163 million. So you're telling me that the common everyday man and woman in Russia is spending $16,000 to build a shelter now? All right, let's get the hell out of Russia. So as everybody is aware, uh, yesterday was election day. So it looks like the wet, red wave that everybody was predicting didn't really happen. It was more of a high tide, if you will. So the the Republicans have definitely taken control over the House. That, they dominated pretty good. The Senate, however, it's a pretty much 50-50 split so far. All the uh, voting isn't in, but the Republicans and the Democrats seem to be at the same number. Uh, it takes 218 uh, seats to control a majority, and they're both at like... Um, like 200 or something like that. So they're at a dead heat for the Senate. But it doesn't matter because most bills have to go through the House first. So if the Democrats come up with some stupid bill, the Republicans can, you know, pretty much put it dead in the water on contact. Other bit of sad news, though, here in New York, the tyrant Kathy Hochul or Hochul, um, she's still the governor. She got elected. I have no idea how that happened. Um, I haven't talked to a single person that was happy with her performance. I know I sure as hell didn't vote for her. Um, but I guess my vote doesn't count here. But yeah, so we're in for some high tides here in New York. So everybody wear your flip-flops and get your snorkels out because we're going to have to swim in a whole world, big pool of crap. So we're, while we're on the subject of New York here, huh, um, a federal judge on Monday, uh, Judge Glenn Sutterby, blocked parts of New York's unconstitutional gun laws that restricted uh, concealed carry rights in certain areas of the state. Well, pretty much all areas of the state. So District Court Judge uh, Glenn Sutterby indicated that the state's in uh, law invoked unprecedented constitutional violations and granted a partial preliminary injunction in favor of uh, basically the people of New York. Now, a preliminary injunction is um, basically it's a restriction on New York from enforcing the law until they can like appeal it, and if it's uh, over overturned, well, then that'll be it. But right now. They can't enforce most of those laws. And I'll get into where they can enforce them and where they can't enforce them in a minute. But it all goes down to this is just a temporary thing until a full ruling can be made. And then the judge has the option to do a permanent injunction, which means that's it. Case over. New York, you, you absolutely lost. You're done. So, Sotheby ruled that the state could still prevent people from carrying guns in Times Square, which I don't understand that, because he said that people that um, conjugate, you can't stop them from carrying uh, in public, basically. So, I don't know what makes Times Square so special, but he also let stand that you can't carry in public playgrounds, libraries, nurseries, and preschools. And courthouses, and um, uh, I think one other place. But he ruled that mental hospitals, places of worship, public parks, state, uh, which include state parks, 
which we never could carry in state parks. Um, that's that's been a long standing rule in New York, but apparently public parks are you know wide open now. The zoo, uh, theaters, conference centers, anywhere uh, uh, peaceful protests take place, and bars. You can carry a gun now in in a bar if you want. Any place that serves alcohol, it's uh, no longer off limits for people with concealed carry permits. If you don't have your gun permit, uh, your concealed carry permit, there's good news on that front, too. Um, he basically struck down the uh, request that you turn over your social media account so you don't have to do that anymore. You don't have to give the names of your relatives and loved ones that live in your house or uh, interact with, whatever that stupid law said. Um you don't have to show good moral character. He pretty much said that is the, the same as their, the licensing scheme that the Supreme Court slapped him around with. It's just reworded. It comes down to the discretion of a licensing officer. If they didn't like your um, train of thought or your political views, they could say you're not, you know, you, you're not good enough to have a permit. So anything that is subjective in the eyes of a, a licensing agent or whoever hands you your permit, they can't do that. Good news for um, applying for a pistol permit. He did let stand the 16-hour training course and the two-hour proficiency course with the handgun. Um, so, But he did stress some concerns over that, citing that it could raise a cost to be, you know, not be cost effective for people to be able to afford the training and um, the training requirements that the state state is uh, requiring. So that car sort of left the door open for fu future litigation. I mean, because the state can virtually keep compiling training requirements and to the point where the average person can't afford to exercise their Second Amendment right. That's come up in a lot of other uh, two-way arguments with courts and in legislatures and stuff. And typically, anything that's found to be restrictive in that sense usually gets slapped down. But in this case, the judge let it stand for now. So basically, the state hasn't said if they intend to appeal or not uh, this decision. My guess is they were waiting until after the election to see if Hochul um, retained her rulingship, um, retained her crown. So I would expect any day now, seeing that Hochul was declared the winner of the election, to uh, have announced that New York is now appealing this judge's ruling. So stay tuned, boys and girls. Same bat channel, same bat time. I'm going to end this podcast now because I'm slightly over 20 minutes, it looks like, in production here. So stay cool, stay frosty, and I'll talk to you when I talk to you. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button if you haven't done that. Give me the thumbs up, that really helps. And go ahead and ring the bell if you uh, want more notifications on my podcast. Stay cool, folks.